Good morning again. I have the privilege and honor to introduce this morning's keynote speaker who is with us now. We are so grateful for that. Reverend Harold Russell Ewell II, ordained in the Missouri Conference of the United Methodist Church. He currently serves as the pastor of Terrace Lake United Methodist Church in Kansas City, Missouri. Additionally, he is the chair emeritus of the United Methodist Associations of Ministers with Disabilities and serves as a board member of Missouri Faith Voices. As a person with a disability in pre-ADA America, his personal and systems advocacy skills began to develop the day his parents enrolled him in kindergarten. Their ophthalmologists and educators forewarned, blind students could not succeed in integrated classrooms. So don't bother dreaming of one day seeing your son graduate from high school with a diploma. Proving conventional wisdom wrong, Russell graduated from Normandy Senior High School and earned a BS in sociology from Southern Illinois University. Yes, you did. In 2009, he distinguished himself by becoming the first blind student to graduate from Eden Theological Seminary in its 168 year history. He also has the distinction of being the first blind person to be ordained in the Missouri Conference of the United Methodist Church. Reverend Ewell advocates for people to realize their power and apprehend their life goals. He gives talks around the country on disability advocacy and awareness, the disability rights movement, the intersections of religion and disability, and the intersectionality of disability and Black theology. Russell is a tireless advocate for a more liberating and inclusive theology of disability. He is passionate about empowering the disenfranchised and assisting all people in realizing their potential, purpose, and worth in the church and society. Reverend Ewell is also the proud husband of the Reverend Adrian Denson Ewell. And Russell, I think we met the Second Institute. You've been around for a long time and it is so good to see you back. My friend, we're happy to have you here at MTSO and at ITD 2020. Let's welcome him. Good morning, everyone. And please accept my apologies. I have a uh, tradition of um, having to place my I have a tradition of having to place my um, um, my alarm clock on the other side of the room. Otherwise, I have a tendency to hit snooze and to go back to sleep. And after uh, a long day yesterday and uh, lots of uh, time in the airport, um, apparently that's what happened. So uh, I am so sorry. You have no idea. I, I apologize so much. Thank you. Thank you. Well, good morning again, everyone. And I would like to thank uh, the core council of um, the Institute on Theology and Disability for uh, this grand invitation. Um, I would like to thank you for uh, uh, asking me to be uh, one of the presenters this year. Um, and I thank my good friend, Kathy, for that wonderful introduction. Um, in full disclosure, uh, my talk is uh, heavily informed by a lecture uh, that I was asked to give uh, at Eden Theological Seminary uh, this past fall, I mean, this past uh, spring, actually, um, on the theology uh, of uh, disability 
uh, but they really wanted me to focus on liberation and um, uh, uh, disability justice. And so I was actually um, given that title. Um, and so this is uh, a portion of the paper that I wrote and the presentation that I gave. Um, now, as we wade into uh, our conversation for today, uh, on the intersections of Black liberation and disability justice. Uh, please allow me to begin with uh, some pertinent uh, background information, uh, which I hope if we have time, I don't think we probably will now, but uh, it was my hope to have time to have some dialogue afterwards. But um, I am an, an African American male who self identifies as a person with a disability. Um, I am blind, um, but also uh, something that I don't talk about a lot and, uh, is having a traumatic brain injury. And um, somehow that gets around me and I don't put that down often, but I need to. Um, and so uh, a close reading of my bio uh, will show that uh, I have personal experience personal living experience uh, at the intersections of black liberation and disability justice. So uh, this is not just an academic endeavor for me, it is uh, the life that I lead. Um, I began advocating for myself, as you heard, uh, at the age of five uh, within a, a school system um, that, uh, uh, that did not care uh, for us, a school system that uh, could not imagine a, a positive outcome for a child who was both blind and who lived with a disability. Um, in my fifth grade year, I, I did not realize that um, I had a, a teacher that year who would change the course of my life. My teacher, um, was angry with me because she thought that I was acting out in class because um, uh, back then there, uh, there was this time when they would ask you to read what's on the board and I couldn't read it. And so um, she got angry because she thought that I was acting out because she would see me playing around, uh, playing with the other kids. And so she just thought that I was just acting. and so. Um, she moved me, which changed her whole floor flow chart. Um, she moved, I used to sit like three rows back um, and to the left. And so she moved me to the front row, which changed her floor chart because she had it in alphabetical order. And then she told me to read what's on the board. And I said, I couldn't read it. And so she got angry with me and she actually picked me up as a child and I took my chair all the way up by her desk and sat me next to the desk. And she said, this is your spot for the rest of the year. I did not realize that she had put in my, um, in my records then that I was um, acting out in class and I had a, what they deemed to be a behavioral disability. Um, and so I was taken out of regular classes in my sixth grade year. And uh, they put me in behavior disabled classes. And so in those classes, basically you just sat in the room all day long. You, uh, there was no um, uh, uh, full, um, uh, I guess, process. There was no um, understandings of uh, reading. There were no uh, lessons on mathematics, uh, no, um, lessons on social studies. You basically just sat and you answered 10, class, 10 questions uh, on a piece of paper and you played cards the rest of the day. Well, I sat around in that class and I said, this is, uh, at, when I got to about the seventh grade, I said, this is not where I'm supposed to be. Um, and I went to, I remember going to uh, the principal and the principal said, in order for you to be able to get out of these classes, you have to test out. And there's no way for you to test out because um, what they, what the, the, the curriculum, quote unquote, 
that you are under um, would not uh, put you at the level of at the rest of your classmates. Little did they know that I had been in conversations with my classmates because um, I was in the band and because I was in choir. And I had a father at the time who was uh, working on his master's degree. And I had a brother at the time who was in high school. And so I would read their books. And um, so I went and I took the test. Um, I told them that I would, and I took the test and they uh, came back and they said, well, you really don't belong in these classes. And so um, they put me in uh, college prep classes from that point on, except for mathematics. Um, sorry, math majors. Um, so, but other than that, I was in uh, college prep classes. And so um, uh, another time that uh, I, I piece that I would like to share with you is when I was in high, well, no, in college, actually, uh, for my undergrad. And um, there was a professor who was there. Um, I initially thought that he was telling me the things that he was telling me because I was a person with a disability. Um, uh, so he one day called me into his classroom and he said, you know what? He said, everyone is not college material. Um, perhaps a trade school would be a better place for you. Um, I later on found out that he told um, several of my friends and colleagues and several of those who had gone on before me um, the, uh, who were African-American. He told them that. Um, at this time I was in, uh, program was communications. Uh, and those people have gone on and they, if you look at the news, they're on the news now, they're anchors, they're doing work um, uh, uh, in, uh, in radio, television, uh, but uh, it was what he told me to try, that sent me actually uh, away from college for a couple of years. Um, I left, um, was working on the line at a, um, at a, at a, at a um, hospital, um, was serving trays, nothing wrong with that. It's good work. But there was something inside of me that said, this is not where you belong. Uh, this is not what you are called to do. And so I, uh, as soon as I said that, uh, maybe about two weeks later, I received a phone call from the uh, counselor at my school, at um, my university. And they said, you know what? The Americans with Disabilities Act was just passed. And that means that uh, we will be able to help those who have disabilities in our schools. And so they uh, said, would you be interested in coming back to school? And I said, oh yes, I would. And so I left that job and I went back to college. Um, and uh, as you've heard from my uh, uh, bio that I graduated from college. Now, uh, my life has been uh, formed and has been shaped uh, by uh, uh, the resistance of the civil rights movement and by uh, mentors who were on the ground uh, in the disability rights movement and by one-on-one -on -one mentorship and um, uh, the mentorships uh, virtually uh, and through books by scholars uh, of, and theologians such as uh, Dr. Nancy Eastland and uh, Dr. James Hal Cone and Dr. Debbie Creamer, our own Dr. Debbie Creamer, uh, Dr. Cornell West. Um, this uh, and my citizen lady, uh, it has shaped my theological framework and it, it has informed who I am as a pastor, uh, as a preacher, as a teacher, as a public speaker, and as a writer, and hopefully one day to be recognized as a public intellectual. Um, I would suppose uh, that most of you all um, uh, possess a basic understanding or knowledge of the term Black liberation. 
So we're not going to uh, spend a, a great deal of time uh, unpacking the fullness of this meaning because we could spend a semester trying to do that. Uh, now, uh, uh, as it relates to uh, theology, the late Dr. James Hal Cohn, uh, he theorized black liberation theology, which he continued to do um, uh, and, and continued to explore, continued to build upon and continued to revise until his death in 2018. Now, just for a simple definition, the, the Westminster um, Dictionary of Theological Terms, it, it offers a basic definition of Black theology. And you will hear me use those two terms interchangeably, Black theology and Black liberation theology, because Black theology is a theology of liberation. And, and so, um, uh, it is a North American theological movement which uh, interprets scripture uh, and the Christian gospel uh, from a context of oppression of uh, Black people uh, engaged in the struggle for spiritual and social and economic and political liberation. Now, before we explore disability justice, uh, and how it intersects with Black liberation. Uh, it, it seems to me uh, that we must first look at the relationship between the civil rights movement uh, and its forerunner uh, of disability uh, justice, uh, which is the disability rights movement. So we are going to take a, a sociological look before we go to the theological look on the liberation on uh, black liberation and disability justice. Now the disability rights movement, like many uh, other social justice movements of the 1960s and 1970s was born out of the civil rights movement. Uh, in the United States, people with disabilities had been advocating for uh, the access to buildings and to employment and to education, to housing and et cetera for decades. However, in pockets around the nation, people with disabilities who had supported the work of the civil rights movement, uh, they were inspired by the success of its strategies. So they made the decision to begin advocating for the rights of people with disabilities in their communities by uh, using these, uh, these same modes of uh, um, uh, resistance, these same modes of peaceful advocacy, these same modes of protest against their own oppressors and their own colonizers. So today with, uh, within books, uh, and documentaries about the disability rights movement. We find leaders such as uh, Max Starkoff, who was the um, founder of Paraquad, which is the Center for Independent Living in St. Louis, Missouri. We find people like Judith Human, um, who was in the Obama administration. I probably don't need to tell you who she is. We find people like Harold Wilkie, who was the, uh, a pastor of the United Church of Christ. and he was one of the signers of the Americans with Disabilities Act. We find people like Ann Roberts, who was considered to be the father of the independent living movement, all sharing how this organic movement was informed and inspired by the civil rights movement. So we see uh, the work for disability rights uh, had learned from the success of those working for the liberation of the African diaspora living in America. Uh, now that, that said, there was a problem though. Uh, although, although the disability rights movement said that, um, uh, that disability is a non-discriminatory group um, in that anyone can join at any time due to accidents, due to injury, due to chronic illness, due to 
diseases and due to the um, expansion and uh, the work of uh, the, um, uh, the health systems. Uh, uh, among those uh, who were working for the, the voices of people with disabilities to be heard in all segments of society, even among those who had experienced the, the sting uh, of biases by an ableist system, uh, there was a hierarchy within the disability community. Uh, here, uh, a androcentric heteronormative, um, basically white males, heteronormative white males uh, who I had disability were at the top and then there was everyone else. Although uh, all of the, its members of this movement were more than willing to put their bodies on the line uh, as activists um, whose uh, 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 protests led to acts such as chaining themselves to buses, such as chaining themselves to buildings, and yes, even chaining themselves to churches. And yes, that was me. Um, it was, amen. It, it was always the, the white men who were called upon to, to negotiate uh, the terms of the disability community's demands uh, with the powers that be. Now, in some instances, black and brown and people and women uh, were at these tables. However, uh, it was rare for them to, to, to get the recognition for the work in which they had done. However, scholars and advocates uh, uh, have uh, now begun to um, uh, of retelling the stories of the movement. Uh, giving credit to all of those who uh, were part of the, the, this process, were part of the, the who contributed to um, the disability rights movement success. And so recognizing that uh, the voices of many within the disability rights movement uh, were not being heard. In 2005, a, a collective of disabled queer women of color uh, formally coined the term disability justice. Disability justice builds on the disability rights movement, uh, taking a more inclusive approach to uh, help secure the rights of people with disabilities by recognizing the, the intersectionality uh, of uh, disabled people who belong to other marginalized groups. The disability justice uh, framework, it asserts, which is interesting because we're doing exactly what it says that it didn't want to happen. Uh, it, is, it asserts that uh, we must include the, the, the experiences of all marginalized people, such as people of color, uh, people uh, with disabilities who, uh, who, uh, who are unemployed, people of, uh, with disabilities who are the immigrants, people with disabilities who are also LGBTQIA+, people with disabilities um, who, um, who are incarcerated, and people with disabilities who land had been stolen. <clears throat> Disability justice. It recognizes how diverse systems of oppression uh, intersect and uh, reinforce one another. Now, Dr. Cone, Dr. James Cone, uh, in a conversation that I had with him when I was trying to flesh out this whole ideal of things that I had been working on um, around black theology and how it might inform um, uh, uh, disability theology. Uh, Dr. Cohn, uh, while sitting in, in his office, he, he once told me that Black theology and Black liberation theology are academic endeavors, and that the, uh, it is the prophetic tradition of the Black church, um, which is how 
um, it is lived out in the community, in the churches, and in the world. And I kind of knew that, but there was something about him saying those words to me that day that a light switch went on. And I felt as though I had an understanding of the thing that I had been wrestling with for so long since uh, Debbie Kramer had challenged me uh, some years ago to do this work. Uh, her thought was, and I asked her, you write about it, why can't you go further and explore it? And she said, uh, it would be inauthentic of me as a uh, white female to do this work. And so I basically took it as a charge because she did charge me <laughs> to continue to do this writing and to do this work. And so um, listening to Dr. Cohn, uh, again, a light went off uh, uh, on uh, how uh, we can look at taking the theology of disability, which we were talking about on yesterday, and how do we get that into, um, uh, uh, into society, uh, into uh, our churches, our mosques, our synagogue? How does that happen? And so um, in, in, in like manner, disability justice uh, is a, uh, uh, in its truest expression, was never meant to be an academic endeavor, nor was it meant to be um, debated or uh, intellectualized or theorized. Instead, uh, it was intended to be a framework for those who were on the ground uh, doing the work, for those who are the most uh, impacted because of their disabilities. Uh, and because of their race, and because of their gender. Now, disability justice, it, it serves as a resource to, to battle the day-to-day the, 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 the -day, uh, issues affecting people with disabilities. Uh, now, it seems to me that uh, the intersections uh, of uh, disability and Black liberation have always been in the mix. There's always been this um, uh, sort of um, uh, uh, understanding amongst each other and how they related to one another. But I, again, I will just, uh, I just started at the disability rights movement at, at that point. And it is clear that the disability rights movement, um, it uh, emerged uh, and developed from the strategies of the civil rights movement uh, and disability justice movement. It grew out of the disability rights movement because of the needs for marginalized voices in this movement uh, to be heard and to be recognized. Uh, so as we look at the future of uh, Black liberation and disability justice, uh, there are individuals who are uh, reflecting now on how uh, Black liberation theology might inform disability theology. Uh, my good friend, uh, Reverend Kendrick Kemp, um, uh, has coined the phrase Black liberation theology of disability. Uh, and his work, um, uh, and, and his work has been guided and, and it has the, and had the blessings of Dr. James Cohn. Uh, and I am exploring now, as you all know, uh, again, um, how black liberation theology uh, might inform uh, possibly a social model of disability in order to uh, begin to have uh, conversations with the work of the late Dr. Nancy Eastland. Um, and to continue to dialogue around disability liberation theology. Uh, it, it, so it, it kind of an answer to um, one of the questions that was asked on yesterday about how do we take this out of academia, the work that we're doing here. Uh, and we see um, uh, change in our communities, change um, in the public square, change in our, again, church, mosque, synagogue. 
uh, it, it seems to me that uh, one of the ways in which we can do that is to begin to um, uh, take this idea of prophetic preaching and prophetic conversations uh, to uh, those settings. Um, and it, 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 it's, uh, it's one of the things that I wanna see. And I've seen it work uh, just in my own settings on how that uh, bringing that prophetic word uh, can help to change people's ideals, understandings, uh, churches, uh, again, mosques and synagogues, ideals and understanding around disability because it becomes part of the culture of that church, of that institution, um, as opposed to just uh, staying in these fine walls amongst ourselves. And I know that you all are already doing that work and um, I look forward to exploring this further with you all. Uh, I look forward to exploring uh, topics uh, and, um, and the contributions uh, in Dr. Kemp's, well, not Dr. yet, in Kendra Kemp's um, uh, upcoming book. Um, uh, it's an uh, anthology uh, around um, how Black liberation might inform disability. Um, now, while my, uh, my commitment to disability justice uh, began at the age of five through self-advocacy. Uh, it has now been turned outwardly uh, to empower people with disabilities, um, uh, to give them, uh, to help to, to form a liberating theology of disability, uh, to advocate uh, in this emerging field, and to advocate for little black disabled children uh, to have a future so bright that they must wear shades. Thank you so much for sharing your, your time with me this morning. Again, I apologize. I, I cut my talk down tremendously because I know that we are running low on time. And so uh, thank you for your, your generosity, for being so gracious. Uh, and bearing with my nerves here because I was running in. Um, so um, <laughs> thank you all so much. Thank you, Russell. We are going to have a moment here for questions and then take a short break before our next keynote. So what do you have for Russell? Topher has a mic there. Russell, this is Devin. Thank you so much for your talk. My question to you is what can those of us who are white do to be allies to you in this endeavor, which I think is so important of black liberation, disability theology, what is, the, what is the thing that us allies can hopefully do to promote you and your work and all the things that you want to accomplish? I think you just asked the question. Okay. <laughs> um, I, I think it is important for uh, us to realize this history, um, to uh, hold to it, to um, and tell it where we go. Um, because often uh, the, the, this history uh, is lost. Um, and I believe that it is important for us to realize from which we've come um, so that um, uh, in a real sense, um, we continue to have these conversations and in a real sense, we don't return back to where we've come from. Um, and so uh, you actually answered, and I'm not sure where you are and who you are, we're talking, but um, uh, it is important, uh, and I think for you, for, for allies, to do exactly what you uh, stated in your questions. And thank you for that. Russell, there are some echoes of your own educational, oops. I'm uh, Neil Cut. Uh, 
there are some echoes of your educational journey that are similar to mine. I too was misdiagnosed with a disability, ended up in special education classes. The importance of teachers mm. in that journey and the ability and the lasting impact of wrongly applied uh, and the importance of good observation, I guess. Uh, how, how do we communicate that more strongly? Because it's, it's at that level too, that is so critical. I, I know that uh, again, so the, the field has changed now. I know that there are more, um, I, I meet so many, particularly when they hear my story and they, um, say that they had children in their classrooms who uh, were experiencing the same thing. And so I am hearing now uh, that teachers uh, are recognizing uh, their limitations uh, and they are also drawing upon um, uh, teachers who have experiences in those areas. Um, but I, I, I'm, I'm speaking, or, or as the term says, I'm preaching to the choir when I say this. Um, of the importance of advocacy and advocating for um, uh, particularly uh, those who we know who are in a public school setting, um, for those of us who have disabilities to uh, have the gumption to advocate for yourselves, um, to uh, say that I know that there's more for me. Um, and so if we can explain that and, and uh, kind of instill that in our children, uh, to uh, to say that what they're seeing is not necessarily the, the end of their journey, that uh, they can do uh, more than what uh, others say that they can do. Uh, I believe that it is important for us to continue to do that. Um, and thank you for that question because it, it's very near and dear to my heart. Um, I, I have had also had instructors on the opposite side, teachers on the opposite side, who saw something uh, and also said that this is not your, the end of your journey and that you can do more. Russell, Bill Gavenna here. Uh, what? Yay. What, what uh, biblical stories or symbols keep coming back up for you that are kind of core to what you're trying to do when that you think when what kind of guide how do you embody that in story biblical story or symbol so it is the the voices uh, and i i did not share and, and bef let me back up and then I, I will answer specifically your question so one of the things that i did not say was that when i was a child my uh, I, I can recall my parents uh, having a conversation again with um, uh, with teachers um, and with um, uh, uh, with uh, people in the medical profession who said that I uh, would not be able to succeed in school. And I was outside of the door and they didn't know that I heard that. But something on the inside of me at that moment said, but what does God say? And it continued on with every time I ran into opposition, I heard this voice that said, what does God say about you? What does God say about this situation? Um, but Bill, uh, specifically, one of the, the texts that I hold to uh, is Romans 12, one and two. Uh, um, I beseech you, sisters and brothers, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. But this is the part. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Uh, in other words, um, and this is talking to the communities, don't be like the people who uh, who are in this world who say that people with disabilities can never achieve. Don't be like the people in our school systems that say that people with disabilities can never rise and could never do uh, the work that God has called them to do. Don't, 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 don't be conformed to this world, 
but have your minds transformed uh, by God. And so that's the text that I hold to. I, I also know that um, I, I, I get pushed back from um, some of my friends in, um, uh, with, uh, who work with people with developmental disabilities and we're not pushed back, just uh, us kind of shaping our conversations. Um, because the thought that some people with disabilities, with intellectual disabilities will never get to that point. But I am in a, in a real sense like Nancy Eastland because I know to whom I'm writing to. Um, and she was very clear uh, that uh, this uh, ideal of a liberating theology of disability would not, um, uh, it would not speak to or speak for all people with all disabilities because of the, the uh, contextualization of the ways in which our bodies move. And so it won't work for everyone, uh, but that is what I hold to be. This is Chantal Unique. I'm sorry, can you hold the microphone closer? Thank you. This is Chantal Unique of Christian Rice. And the part of your story which resonated with me was when you framed yourself as an advocate from age five. I think that that was part of my story that I've never really recognized before. And it's probably the part of the story that a lot of people in this room and I both like lament that because it's not an experience of a typical five-year-old to have to advocate for, for yourself on the playground. But I also Rejoice in that because look at the good things that God has done with that. And um, I know very little about liberation theology, so thank you for broadening my knowledge more. Um, but what I do know of liberation theology, or what I've heard, is that where um, theology that's not liberation based is based upon theoretic, with developing a, a theory and then trying to do it, liberation theology is more about practicing it and then maybe possibly writing it down or not. And I think all of us in this room would do well to make sure that we practice what we're writing down. Mm. Uh, you are correct. Um, one of the things that uh, I, I kind of love about um, the, where I've seen uh, the Institute go, uh, yeah. and even from its uh, inception, I believe, um, is that there's these conversations now uh, about how do we uh, take what we're doing in academia uh, and begin to practice them uh, in the world. And uh, that is so important to uh, realize. And I think uh, Hans Reiner talked a little bit about that on the, uh, the video last night. Um, of the importance of uh, us moving from these structures, these wonderful structures. And again, like I said, when James Cone said that to me, it, it was like a, a revelation. I knew that that was the case. And I knew that black liberation and black uh, theology were academic endeavors. And that the way that it was lived out in the black church and in the other churches, was through the prophetic teachings and preachings. I knew that, but it was like a light went on. And so uh, that's the place where I stand now. Um, I, I do, um, I did not also say that uh, that is my tradition. I, I preach uh, from the prophetic traditions of the church and I teach from the prophetic traditions of the church and I'm on the ground when my colleagues will allow me um, to be in the streets because um, they're always concerned that I won't see something coming at me. And so they fear for my life um, uh, with my advocacy and protests. But yes. Thank you, Chantel. Hi. I'm Shelly Christensen. And I want to just give a huge message of honor and thanks to your parents. Mm -hmm for a child of five years old to become their own advocate speaks so much about your family and your parents. And I, I also wanted to ask your thoughts 
on helping parents get to that place that your parents went to, helping okay. parents to to go through that journey that parents go through that so that loss, grief, loss, to get to the point of joy, to get to the point of collaboration, to get to the point of bringing their hopes and dreams to the table and, and encouraging their child to bring their hopes and dreams to the table and then getting that whole educational system and the whole congregational system to just meet them where they're at instead of saying we can't do this we can't do that we know that one of the biggest barriers to uh, belonging in a congregation particularly is when one member of the family is 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 marginalized is discounted the whole family once is just lost so i that's my question what do you think there's my I, question I, I, I think you just made me cry i um you you brought out an emotion uh, that i had not experienced in, in, in quite a while um because my parents were were struggling when i look back uh in retrospect my, my parents had no idea on what they were doing they really did um but they were willing to um to listen to me i i, I credit my my mom wanted to shelter me wanted to hold me um did not want to see anything happen to me just love on me um my dad um he wanted to make me a part of the conversation so that day after he, they'd had that conversation with um, educators and with ophthalmologists, they, I, I can remember them having many conversations about what they're gonna do about their child. Um, and my dad came to me one day and he said, well, what do you want to do? As a child, he asked me that question. And I said, I want to go to school with my friends who I play with on a day-to-day -day basis. And so that was the beginning of the, this whole journey. Was well, is because my parents continue to believe they're people of great faith um, uh, and continue to believe that whatever their child did, um, that it was going to be what uh, God had intended for their child. So um, I, I, I would continue to encourage uh, families of children with disabilities to continue to advocate for your children, continue to advocate um, and to make sure that you are at the table, uh, of course, uh, with the IEPs, if you're in America, um, the, the IEPs, um, but also to, to know your child, even beyond what the school system says that your child can do. Uh, I have known um, people who, um, who were students um, who were very, very, very smart. Um, I have friends who went to special school systems through the system. And they had colleagues, friends who were very, very, very smart, but because they listened to the school um, and the school that told them that they would never achieve, they never fully uh, recognized the totality of who they might become. Um, and so again, I, I just encourage you all to continue to advocate. Uh, I've known people who uh, have, uh, who were told that um, they could never achieve, they could never um, uh, uh, graduate from high school, such as my story, but they had other teachers who went to bat for them because they knew that that child could do it. 
Um, and so that is so important for us to continue to do this advocacy. And whoever that was who, who said that, asked that question, I'm mad at you because you made me cry. <laughs> so we have one more question and then Russell will be around today if you wanna keep in conversation with him. Russell, I think you know who this is, but, I do. <laughs> but long, long ago, um, someone once said to me, you gotta be who you is. Um, and I'm so thankful that that voice continues because so much of our journeys, though different, are the same. And I'm so thankful that your voice is in this conversation. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you.